I think we need more people that will come and listen to our story. The biggest problem with nuclear is we all preach to other nuclear about how important nuclear is, and it's like, this is the wrong audience. My name is Diane Zell. I work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I focus in nuclear instrumentation, and I'm in the reactor and nuclear systems division. Back when they were originally working on the MSRE, there was a lot more freedom to try things and experiment um, in ways that just aren't allowed these days because of safety, which is very important. Um, So definitely the instrumentation to monitor the performance of the reactor is going to be critical, but also having a full understanding of what the salt is doing, whether it's a fuel salt or a coolant salt, is going to be really important. So characterizing that salt before you ever get the reactor up and running is really crucial, and and that's what Ryan has focused on um, by performing this thermophysical measurement. Uh, There were teams and teams of excellent, excellent chemists and engineers working back in the day, so... You know, we like to think that we're, you know, we have the best knowledge now, but actually we're learning quite a bit still. There are numerous reports um, on the work that they did and not enough people honestly here to even sh- uh, shuffle through all the great science that they were doing. I'm going to talk to you guys today about the development of test apparatus for thermal conductivity measurements um, that we developed here at Oak Ridge National Lab. First, I want to point out that uh, Ryan Gallagher is actually the engineering lead on this. My name is Ryan Gallagher. I'm also a member of the uh, Reactor and Nuclear Systems Division, the Nuclear Experiments and Irradiation Testing Group, where I focus on designing irradiation experiments for the high flux isotope reactor. And more recently, I've been involved with measuring the thermal conductivity of molten salts. I was tasked with designing a system to measure the thermal conductivity of molten salt, basically how well it transfers heat from one point to another. It's a pretty difficult measurement to make. It's routine for solids, um, but when you get to liquids, things are moving around and not staying uh, where they are. So you get things like heat transfer by convection uh, as well as radiative heat transfer. And so to move past those and to look just at how salts can conduct heat uh, is actually a, a pretty difficult problem. We based our design off of J.W. Cook's 1970 variable gap design. Um, It was developed here at Oak Ridge also. There was extensive literature on this. I mean, by extensive, I mean maybe three documents, but there was a lot of information in those documents. A 20-year effort that finished in the 70s. Wow. So we're in year one. The the first (laughs) document I could find was from 1952, was the first version of it. And the most recent uh, version was from the 70s. So they spent a lot of time and a lot of money optimizing this design and we're trying to build off of what they learned. What's nice about it is because it's small, you do not have to have a lot of salt to perform this measurement. And that also limits the convection and it's relatively inexpensive. They make a nice laser flash system. However, it's 200K and it can take up to a year to acquire that. The test apparatus that we've developed, it's if you got a stainless steel one, it's about 13K. If you went with Inconel, it's about 25K. And then all of the supporting materials would be a one-time purchase, and that's around 25K also. Molten salt to stay molten needs to be at extreme temperatures. So if you're measuring the thermal conductivity of a metal, you may be doing that at room temperature, but to... Uh, because that's what it's going to be operating at for the salt. It will be operating, you know, six, seven, eight hundred degrees C. And is this primarily a challenge of building the hardware, or is it uh, just as much modeling and simulation as it is the it's physical stuff? Heaters and stuff aren't always designed to go up to eight hundred, nine hundred degrees Celsius. We have a tube furnace, which is off the shelf. Tube furnaces can go up to much, much higher temperatures than we're interested in. But anything that goes inside of that experiment apparatus needs to also be rated for extreme temperatures and that's where the challenge is. Um, It's hard to find off-the-shelf things for precision measurement. Well and it's a material selection problem so you you have to be able to survive the corrosiveness of the salt and reach these temperatures so that that can be challenging and and to to elaborate more on how custom this has to be if you went to a vendor and said i need a heater that goes to this temperature it's a one-off experiment they're not interested in manufacturing between one and ten of these when you know they have industry that will buy thousands of other heaters so we have to build it ourselves 
So here you can see the top heater with a thin layer of salt, and this is the outer containment. We do have cooling channels that forces the heat to flow down. We performed some CFD simulations so that we could optimize our design and understand where some of the starting points we should go to. So for our variable gap, we found that if we set the gap to less than 0.5 millimeters, we could get less than 1% uncertainty. To be conservative, we set it to less than 0.2 millimeters. So if you can imagine it's like a pot of salt and you're trying to force the heat to flow in one direction through that pot of salt versus... Mm -hmm. So, so he specifically designed this to remove any convection heating. And the way he did that was with his top heater and then his cooling channels and then just natural thermodynamics come into play at that point. Prohibit convection? Yes, that's one of the main goals of this experiment is to limit convection as much as we possibly can. So we can look at just how heat's transferred through conductive heat transfer. We don't want any movement of the salt. We want to limit that as much as possible. At this bottom corner, you can see the top heater containment. Here's a picture of Ryan performing some electrical testing to ensure that our heater wires and our thermocouples are not shorted internally. Everything was thoroughly cleaned and then assembled inside a furnace. And then here you can see the furnace sealed up and testing starting. A thermocouple comes in through the top heater and then the thermocouple comes in through the outer containment and you measure the difference in temperature across that thin layer of salt. We used helium and argon to do some calibration measurements. We were within 5% of what was documented for helium. This is actually the thermal resistance of helium. The thermal conductivity would just be the inverse slope. We have a need to determine experimentally what some of these basic properties are, not just thermal conductivity, uh, heat capacity, density, viscosity, so that we can plug these into you know, engineering models and simulations. We want to have a database of multiple different salt chemistries and then um, people who are actually developing these reactor designs can come in and select which salt would be optimal for their design based on these four physical properties. The first salt that we measured was Flynac. Here you can see it loaded into the outer containment, which is in this salt cavity region. Looking at the literature, the most recent measurement that we could find was a 2016 hot wire. It's a single point at 500 degrees C. And then there's also a laser flash. We fall somewhere in the middle. Now these are preliminary results. Literally, the last data point was taken yesterday. When you get into nuclear technology, I know that there's some limitations on the information that you can share. If we're talking about salts, like is there anything that you guys do, you can't share that on public databases? Salt chemistry is very proprietary per collaborator. So a molten salt reactor designer, they, they're going to develop a salt specifically for their reactor. And so that is proprietary information. So we can't share that. They share that with us because we have NDAs in place. So you, you wouldn't necessarily put their exact... Uh, composition on there, but you could speak to a more general level. So it's not so much that we're focused on any specific salt. Um, we we will be as we move through the program, but in the early stages, we're just ensuring that we have a reliable, robust test apparatus. We do have quite large error bars, and some of that is impacted by the experimental procedure. As we go through and perform these experiments, we're learning ourselves. We're finding ways to reduce human error by implementing better practices in our procedure. Do you guys actually build stuff and then find out it it fails? Like, do you routinely tear through hardware as you're trying to figure out what works best? Yeah, yeah, we do. We went through that exercise multiple times of building, testing, figuring out what broke and what didn't break, reassembling uh, and revising our design. Um, it's, it's part of the job, part of what we do um, when we're building experiments. So it could try to expect as much failure as you possibly can when you're designing it. Well, and so much research out here, even outside of this campaign, is iterative science. So you come up with a design, you model it, you simulate it, you try to optimize it as best you can in your simulations, but you're going to learn lessons as you're actually testing. So you're going to implement what you learn as you go through, and that's where you get this iterative design. And I think something that's unique about working at ORNL, specifically with this project, is Ryan has come up with a lot of interesting ideas that came out of the development of this test apparatus. So in, he's had the ability to kind of try some of those things out, developing unique types of heaters and um, smaller test apparatuses that maybe people haven't thought of previously 
that you can't do that if you just work in industry. You don't have the ability to tinker. The test apparatus is designed for fuel or non-fuel salt. Um, you know, for tokamak reactors, they're interested in having salt blankets. Um, we use it for fuel and coolant, um, but solar. Yeah, solar is a great area. To get, you know, I'm, they're just as interested in the heat transfer properties as we are. Mm -hmm. We may be a little bit biased because we're surrounded by people who are always enthusiastic about nuclear, but I, I see a lot of good things going on. There's a ton of good work going on right here at this lab, but also all the national labs around. There's a lot of industry involvement. Nuclear actually was just an application for me when I started out. You know, I could do a lot of things. I, I studied um, low noise front end electronics and a lot of biomedical applications, a lot of automotive applications, but nuclear just kind of has always stood out as being the most interesting. It has the most quirky, fun people to work with, and it's it's challenging. It's and it's challenging. Um, it's pushing the limits of technology in a way that automotive is, uh, aerospace is, and that's kind of why I was like, you know, I really want to be in this organization. And I want to focus on nuclear. It's the future. And and what uh, sorry, where where do you work every day? What's the lab? Is it at Ornell or? Yes. Yeah, so we so both work. At you work Oak here. Like yeah, we both right, are physically like located. Next building over. What's it like working at Oak Ridge? It looks like you're working in a giant park. Lots of trees and everything. You know, it's pretty crazy. It's actually fantastic. I love it. I'll I'll well. come out here and, and run on campus. It's a very positive work atmosphere. Maybe I'm a little biased because we have a fantastic yeah. group. We have a very young group. I'd say the average age is probably like thirty. For our group, which is not as common out here, there was a, a big gap in, in, you know, people retiring and people hiring. Mm -hmm. You know, you can run some of the greenways on site and find old experiments, run across a lot of wildlife, and it's just, it's a great, it's a great place to work. You can look around and you'll find the expert in just about anything here at the lab. You know, mm -hmm. you want to look into quantum physics for whatever reason. There's probably an expert here. It's probably an expert in biology, chemistry, any branch of science. We have some of the top minds here working, and that's what I love about this place. And uh, do you have any advice for anyone who is inter interested in any of these topics of the educational path that would be optimal? Internships are really some of the best ways to get in here because if you come in, it's it's usually a short, you know, three months. Um, you get exposed to the lab itself, the lab infrastructure, and you know people within the organization. And and typically, if you have a good mentor, um, they push you to network and meet people outside of just that single focus. It's not as hard as people yeah. think. I know, as an undergrad, I thought I would never get an internship at Oak Ridge, and and then I got one, and now I work here. <laughs> yes, I guess I would agree. I I actually had two internships during my undergrad, one at Brookhaven, one at Berkeley Lab, and um, we actually bring over 300 interns every summer here to just, just Oak Ridge, and I'm sure there's thousands if you count the other labs. It's not as hard as people would think. A lot of times you might think it'd be, oh, it must be really competitive to get here, but um, we're happy to get as much help as we can over yeah, the summer. Yeah, we need them as much as they want to be here. You know, we, we, <laughs> you know I never expect um, an intern to come in knowing exactly what we do because it's just, you're never going to find that perfect person. So uh, you take the shot and see if you can get a job at one of these labs. And it's, you know, a great learning experience. You'll learn a ton over mm -hmm. a couple months. As the demand for energy is increasing and existing reactors are shutting down, people are quickly seeing we've got to do something, we've got to make a change or we're going to not have power to a lot of people. Um, so I definitely think there's opportunity in the nuclear world. And if you saw yesterday TVA um, discuss the Clinch River site, which could be a molten salt reactor, could be a small modular reactor, could be a high temperature gas reactor. I mean, it just, it depends on the NRC and licensing and who's who's ready to pull yeah. the trigger when TVA is ready to pull the trigger. There's multiple reactor designs out there trying to get to be the first one so mm -hmm. I can't say for sure that would be molten salt but we'd love for it to be. We'd love for it to be yeah. Do you guys think that there's anything 
to talk about that I'm overlooking. Anything you want to get off your chest? I have like <laughs> strong opinion about anything. <laughs> no, no, not that. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> stupid nitrate salt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks a lot. That sure. Was wonderful. Thanks, Ryan. Great, Dan. Thank you. Thank you.